This is the first of several movies I'm doing on the Steady State Fate Ultra Random Analog. In this movie, I'm going to give you an overview of this module and a brief demo of what it can do. And then in the subsequent movies, I'm going to go into each section in a lot more detail. The Ultra Random Analog, or URA for short, is indeed inspired by the famous Buchla Source of Uncertainty. However, Steady State Fate has taken this module in quite a different direction than your typical tribute module based on the Source of Uncertainty. The URA does have an internal clock. You can see it's clock out pulse here and it's clock speed here. I'm going to do something a little different with my patch cords. I'm going to actually color code my cables coming out of the URA to the data so you can better follow what's going on. So there is the clock pulse coming out of the URA. There's a pitch control input called clock FM that does indeed track at one volt per octave. So you can use this as another oscillator and I'll show that in a later movie. And there's also an external clock input. Normally, most of the sections on the URA default to following the internal clock. Some of the sections can follow the external clock. Next are two sample and holds, A and B. And you see these LEDs underneath will indicate what they're up to. Both are normaled to an internal noise source, but you can bring in external inputs as well. And the level of that is controlled by these knobs. Sample and hold A always follows the internal clock, and I'll patch its output over to input one in the data. And as I turn up the sample level, you'll start to see different voltages start to come out of that sample and hold. Sample and hold B defaults to following the internal clock, but if you patch an external clock, it'll follow that instead. Let's go ahead and patch that over to the data as well. Its output's on the other side down here. I'll bring that in right here. And again, it's normal to noise and has its own level control as well. And there's its output. It varies a little bit from sample and hold A in that it does have its own slew to smooth out the signal. I'll turn those down for now. There's also an additional output called toggle A, B out. Let me get this cable out of the way so you can read that better. That alternates in between the A output and the B output, but it does it at a slight delay, so it's never the same as those two outputs. So this gives you, in essence, a third sample and hold circuit that's loosely based on A and B as if it's an analog shift register of some sort. In addition to the normal clocking sample and holds, there is a random gate and pulse generator. You can go anywhere from very slow to, as I turn this up, almost audio rates, and it has a speed division control underneath. It can be used to trigger other devices, and it's also normal to go through this opto integrator. The opto integrator is a sort of slew circuit that's based on a light sensing resistor as opposed to your normal circuitry, so it has a little bit of natural decay to it. You can patch into that section and use it separately, and also control how fast or slow it is along with this integrate slope knob up here. Finally, there's a random flux output, or R flux for short. It's similar to the continuously variable random voltages you get out of a source of uncertainty type module. But again, it's a little bit different. It is based off the internal clock, and you do have control over its voltage range, and again, how fast it responds to changes. Now again, I'll demonstrate all of these features in a lot more detail in future movies, Let's just bring up something very simple, like a drone on the Moog. That's based off of two oscillators, the Moog's internal oscillator, and then a second oscillator coming from a disting. I have them tuned to different pitches so you can tell them apart more easily. I have them both set up to my keyboard right now, so I can go ahead and transpose them around as desired. Let's start with sample level A. Again, I've got it normaled into channel A and the disting. And for starters, I'm gonna patch it up to something pretty obvious like the filter cutoff frequency. Now, what that sample and hold is sampling is based off of the sample level. It's an attenuator. Again, it is normal to noise. And as I turn it up, you get this patch cord out of the way so you can see the data is displayed a bit better. You will see changes in the green trace and here changes in filter cutoff. Again, this follows the internal clock. This goes up to audio rate. Where basically you now have noise modulating the filter cutoff. That's a nice little tempo there. You can use it for obvious things, such as the filter cutoff, or something even crazier like our VCO pitch. But 
you can also use it for things that are a bit more subtle, such as in this case, I'm gonna use it to modulate the mix between our two different oscillators, which again are different pitches. So this timbre changes you hear are this sample and hold output randomly varying between the Moog zone oscillator and one in the disting. Again, I'll try to pull some cables out of the way here so you get a better idea what's going on. Now there's also this sample B output. And initially I'm gonna patch that up to the filter cutoff as well, because we already know what that sounds like. Again, it has an input attenuator, and again, it's normal to noise following the internal clock. I'm gonna get my hand out of the way here so you can see the LEDs underneath, see how they follow the output voltage. Now, sample and hold B deviates from A in a couple different ways. One, it does have a built-in slew circuit to smooth out these changes. And also, it's capable of following the external input. So let me go ahead and treat the LFO and the Roland 540 as an external clock signal. I'll just take something like the square wave, and again, I'll patch it into the data so you can see what it's up to. The yellow trace is it running at its own speed. And let's go ahead and patch this clock signal, and in my normal patching scheme, I use green for clocks, to the external clock input. Now you hear that the timbre changes triggered by sample and hold A are happening at a different pace than the filter changes being triggered by the Roland 540. Let's make these very different speeds. see the blue trace now is only changing when the yellow clock trace has a rising edge. And again, I can clock this at different rates. And if I pull this external clock input, sample and hold B goes back to following the internal clock. I'll remove the cables that I'm not using anymore just to clean things up. Turn down some mount right now so the filter doesn't close down quite as much. The clock does have a clock range switch, so if you're finding this a bit touchy, I can slow it down to different divisions. Either fast or slow. A little easier to control for these sort of non-audio applications. Okay, finally I told you that there was indeed this toggle output, toggle A, B. It takes an alternate between what's happening on sample A and on sample B, and again, delayed slightly. Let's go ahead and patch that into the data. Up here. And you'll see that the yellow trace coming out of the toggle AB is indeed changing at the same speed that the two other sample holds are. But if you look closely, its signal is alternating in between what A is doing and what B is doing, but delayed. I'm gonna show that in a lot more detail in the next movie. Just to clean things up, I'm gonna pull that for now. I mentioned it also has a smoothly varying output, this random flux. I'm gonna go ahead and take random flux output, plug that into channel four in the data, so you can see it smoothly changing along there. It's basically following the internal clock. And whenever the internal clock changes, it says, let's head towards a new value. I see it start to go down there. go faster to get faster changes out of it. And I can patch that to something else different, such as say, the filter resonance, which is up here. So the filter resonance slowly drifts to being higher or lower in level. Right now it's low, but now it's drifting upward to be more resonant. We have voltage control again over that smoothing and the voltage range. And I'll show that to much greater effect in a later movie. Finally, there's this random pulse output, which we can use for a number of things. We can go ahead and use that to directly make the resonant jump. And I 
can make it happen more quickly. Up to audio rates. Or something slower. It has seven different clock divisions, each one being a divide by two, that not only make it slower, but also more regular. Now you might notice this LED adjacent to it is changing color every time that the pulse LED changes. Let's go ahead and instead take its output because the random pulse output is normal to this opto integrator. Take that output. And every time there's a pulse output now, you see that yellow curve go up to say, let's go high with the pulse. And every time this LED goes off, saying that that random gate is off, the opto oscillator voltage, the yellow line drops as well. Again, we have control over its smoothness. It can be very slow in changes. Or much faster in changes. But it's not quite instantaneous because it is going through a vactral type circuit, which is giving it a little bit of natural decay. Finally, you can interpatch parts of the URA to each other. For example, let's say we don't want this evenly paced clock. Maybe we want to vary up and down in speed. Well, one way to do that would be to take the random flux output and run that into the clock FM, frequency modulation, or basically voltage control of the clock. So let me go ahead and grab our R flux output, patch it over to clock FM, and watch the spacing of those pink traces for the clock. See them get closer together and further apart. And also hear the changes speed up or slow down. So we're using a slowly fluctuating random voltage, which happens to be driven by the clock, to change the speed of the clock at each pulse. I have everything cranked up right now. We can, of course, pull things back make the changes more subtle. Slower integration there as well. Slower changes on the slew. So that's a quick lesson in the SSF Ultra Random Analog. In the next few movies, we're gonna go in each of these sections in a lot more detail, expanding on some of these ideas I've shown you so far.